and I want to welcome everybody and the ones that can stand and wants to stand. Turn to page 112, and we're going to do the first and the last verse of it, and then I've got another one. 112, first and last verse. <laughs> We'll do all three verses of it. 393. <clears throat> This is 
Thank you all. Thank you. All right. So it's calling for snow Sunday. All right. Saturday. Yay. All right. So just a fresh reminder because we got no snow last year. So here's how we do it, and especially for those of you who might be new. So if it snows Saturday night and stuff, and there's snow uh, Sunday morning on the roads, and especially if it's in the parking lot and everything, it gets slick as goose knot. Yeah. <laughs> it gets slick as that out here and especially down the sidewalks. So if we cancel church Sunday, uh, it'll be canceled all day, everything, all day, okay? Um, we don't cancel just the morning, then make a plan for the evening. If we cancel in the morning, everything, everything, all right? And so what we'll do is I'll put a message on the answering machine. I try to do it as early as possible. So if you call the church office and you get an answering machine that says, thank you for calling Shadow Heights Baptist Church, I'm sorry we're unavailable right now, but if you leave your name, number, and a brief message, we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Thanks and have a great day. <laughs> that means I haven't put a message on yet. <laughs> if you call it and I go, no church today, canceled, snow day, then you know you don't come to church on Sunday, all right? And so it's real simple. That's how we do it. And then you call everybody you know and let everybody else call everybody they know. And before you know it, everybody that's known is called. And then we get the word out. So can you do that? All right, so I have a feeling we're going to be doing that, um, but maybe not, maybe not. We've been fooled before, haven't we? Oh, yeah. Whoa, hold on. Uh, I'm hard to hear, and I can't hear but one at a time. Uh, yeah, I'll probably put it on Facebook if I remember. Yeah, I think we got some text app, don't we? Didn't Michael do that? Yeah, so if you're not signed up for the text app, shame, shame on you. You really should be. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll let Michael know early and, and everything. Who else was talking? Okay, just, okay. So anyway, that's the plan, Stan, all right? And we'll go from there. I hope the snow just moves on. And we just go on, have like normal, and then it snows like in the middle of the week, so you don't have to go to work. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, the Lord knows, right? Uh, so we're going to do that. A couple of prayer requests for you tonight. Um, uh, keep Daniel and Nina in your prayers, if you would. Nina's been having some, some health issues, and so please, please just pray for her. And, and if you think about it, uh, if you send them a text or something, just encourage them. be nice to do. And um, also, we have uh, several that have been sick and uh, just, you know, the Lord knows we're going through that season. So half the church is sick one Sunday, the other half the next Sunday. It just works that way. <coughs> and I can't get rid of this cough to <laughs> save my life. <coughs> but anyway, um, pray for them. Uh, pray for Jim and Barbara Crow. They used, used to sit on the very back row. And they haven't been able to get out for a while. So just pray for them. And pray for Rod. Pray for, for his eye. He can't, can't see in the dark. So pray, pray for him. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, my buddy Lee, he, him and I know way back. I've known him for long enough to marry Barbara. And uh, he's been praying for me. And I've been talking to him for a couple days. I think he's talking to him once a week. 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 Uh, yep, Lee. Pray for Lee. And Lee usually listens, so um, hopefully he's able to listen to it tonight. Yeah, Chuck, he's having a bypass surgery. Yeah, so pray, pray for him. You know, I don't know. She told me, but she talks so fast I can't hear. And I can't understand, and so I just go, okay. Hopefully somebody else will get the information and tell me when I need it. I think it kind of shocked Chuck because he didn't realize. He didn't realize he was at, yeah. That he was 
Yeah, but we do need to pray, pray for them. Chuck Adams, yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, amen. Um, and her request, my little granddaughter, she is still has a lot of health issues. She had an appointment today, um, and she has been diagnosed with an eating disorder that affects all of her children. Um, and it's called Haika, and it stems from, um, from the Yeah, she could pick up a lot of diseases that way too. Yeah. All right, let's remember, what's her name? Jalen. So let's remember little Jalen. Anybody else? Um, yeah, te she texted me today. I guess she's doing better because she was texting me Bible questions. So, yeah, I didn't think to ask her, was she feeling better? I'm not real good at that stuff. She said she's feeling better, so there you go. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, pray, pray for our leadership in this country and around the world. Um, <coughs> we're, we're doing the, our dead level best to get involved in things that we really shouldn't be getting involved in. And we're in no financial position. We're not in any physical position uh, to fight a war. And especially if it's a multifaceted one, um, yeah, just pray. Pray for wisdom. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. So remember Bob's sister. He did call me the other day and ask. So um, please pray for, for his sister. And the hospice has been called in. It it's, looks like it's just a matter of time for, for that. Yes, sir. I want to thank everybody for prayers for me. Amen. Glad you're back. Amen. You were looking mighty rough the other night. Yeah. I don't look, I don't look good anyway. No, nah, well, <laughs> look, man, we were trying our best to be nice, all right? <laughs> yeah. I'd rather you kick him than the TV. <laughs> we'll unleash you out there. Yeah, it's, I, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. You know, I, I, I try my best to understand that people with a different mindset, they just, they grow up with a different mindset or they develop a different mindset. And, you know, stupid people don't know they're stupid. And I, I do my, my dead level best to just, Try to let things roll off my back like that. Well, most of the time it does. Most of the time, but every now and then, it's like the cork is ready to, to pop, right? And it's just, it's the last straw that breaks the camel's back. I get it, hon. I get it. I get it. Um, yeah, I really do get it. That's why I, I quit watching so much news uh, because it was, I have to keep up with what I do. I have to keep up with stuff. But I was watching so much of it that it was just affecting me. And I want to be free. I want to be happy and joy-filled. I don't want to be inundated with it. Well, I... It makes me happy you wanted to kick your TV, too. Believe me. Yeah. Right. The world is upside down. It's upside down, and I believe God's getting ready to shake it. Exactly. It makes you angry inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was talking to my mom the other day, and we were both saying, we're, I'm really glad my dad 
has gone. My dad died in 2016, and, and my dad was very, he was very angry, and he was a little bit unstable. <laughs> and <laughs> just, just a little. And uh, he'd have done gone, we'd have read about him on the news, you know. And uh, I, I really am glad that he didn't have to go through that because he would get so upset and so angry. And I, I'm thankful that the Lord went ahead and took him before all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. People are open around the world. They're hard here. They're hard in Europe, but they're open at other places around the world. And thank God that we have missionaries to go. <coughs> One last prayer request and then uh, we'll pray. Who, who'd like to open us up in prayer, by the way? Who? Travis? All right. All right. So we'll, we'll open up one last prayer request before we start. Um, I had uh, a friend uh, online, a pastor friend, and he uh, works with evangelism, uh, like in a uh, Southern Baptist convention, a state convention, works with evangelism. And he was telling me that there is right now, which I didn't know, uh, apparently around the United States, there's a, a pandemic of pastoral suicide. And, you know, we don't hear about people keep that stuff hush hush, don't they? But apparently there is a, a, a tremendous amount of depression. And instead of quitting and, and moving on with life, these men are, are committing suicide. And that absolutely breaks my heart. And so let's, you know, I, I would like for us to real, remember, especially throughout this year, let's pray for our fellow churches. Let's pray for our, the pastors out there. A lot of them have quit preaching because they're so defeated and so discouraged and depressed. And our churches is very different than most churches in the broad spectrum of America. We're vibrant. We're alive. Most churches in America are on the decline. The average size Baptist church in the United States is less than 50 people. It's between 35 and 50. And so we're, we're well above that average. And also, the, the number of pastors who have to go uh, back into the workforce is on an increase, because, and that makes them feel like they're unsuccessful, they're failures, and because they can't make the church grow. Well, it's not up to the pastor to do that anyway. It's up to the pastor to fill the pulpit. It's up to God to fill the pews, you see. And so they're very discouraged and very defeated. And it just, you know, as I was talking to him, it really broke my heart. Because we're not talking about just small church guys either. We're talking about some, some church, big churches. And they just feel so discouraged, so defeated. And I believe the devil is working overtime. I, I really do. And um, if you wouldn't mind, just as you pray in the mornings or evenings, whenever you pray, just lift up the pastors in America. Lift up our churches. A lot of times we cut them down because they quit doing. Or a lot of times they've quit doing because they're just, they're losing ground. Yeah, they're not, they're not bad. Yeah. It is super hard right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I go through it on every day that ends with why. But it's the reality is, is that these guys are going through it in a severe way. And so uh, it breaks my heart. I wish I could do something. I really do. Wish I could just. Yeah. 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 Um, since I'm the old guy now, 
and I've been here for a long time, um, a lot of times people will call me. A lot of these guys will call me, Pastor Paul, what should I do? You know, they hate me over here. Well, they hated me here too for a while. You just, you got to just outlive them. <laughs> you can act sad at the funeral and rejoice on the way home, whatever you got to do. <laughs> Look, if it wasn't true, I told you, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> but I, I tell them, you know, what do you mean? And this is generally what it comes down to, is that people don't want preaching. They don't want the Bible. And there's a handful of people in every church that really does. And what has happened over the last 20 to 40 years is that the Bible has been put to the side. And so if you get a young pastor in and he's excited and he wants to teach and he wants to preach, he gets very defeated and very discouraged because we tried that before. That didn't work. And you know what? The gospel always works. It just takes time. Yeah. So anyway, that was my special prayer request. I appreciate it. All right. So Travis is going to open us up in prayer and I'll, <laughs> I'll read our list of names and then we'll jump back into our Bible study tonight. And Father God, we just come to you thanking you and praising you for the opportunity and the privilege to lift these names to you one more time. And we pray, Father, that you would just work in the hearts of these folks, Lord. Bring salvation to them. Bring someone who can sow the seed or water the seed and give them clarity, Lord, so they see the need of salvation before it's eternally too late. We lift up to you Beck and Nick and Gary and Britton of Aya. Sophia, Savannah, Mason, Jimmy, Tristan, Katie, Alexis, Tabitha, Deanna, Juliana, Eric and Jim and Teresa and Desiree and Darlene, Chris, Ken, Melissa, Douglas and Angel, Caitlin, Carter, Joseph, Jax, Jordan, Jason, Amanda, Abigail, Lillian, Madison, David, Debbie, Lori and George. We lift up to you tonight David and Jennifer, Isabella, Madeline, Camden, Coulter, and Leanna. We lift up Denise and Larry, Jason, and Dan, and Lacey, and Neil, Scott, and Robin, and Davey, and Connie, AJ, Rachel, Patrick, Laura, Chris, Dean, Randy, Trey, Curtis, Larry, April, Neil, Heather, and Beth. We lift up to you Destiny and Justin, and Corey and Wendy, Langston, Blake, Kathy, David, Kenneth, Chad and Andy, Robert, Tori, Heather, Chris, Susan, Stacy, Emery and Ellie and Shepard, Beth, James, Renee, Wayne, Beth and Serenity, Kim and Lee and Elaine, Olivia, Gary, James, Willie, Eddie, Greg, Michael, Winter, Michael, Hazel, Pat, Paige, Aaron, Grant, Rebecca, Ashton, Tress and Alan. We lift up to you Timothy and Andrew and Brittany and Marcus and David and Brandy and LaDawn and Brandon and Danielle and Dean and Jasper and Silas, Jennifer, Chris, Beth and Ronald and Patty, Jackie, Kasim and his family, Brittany, Kenny, Dylan, Dam Damien, Wyatt, Bryson, Monica, Blaine, Jennifer, Fred, Andrea, Margaret, Autumn, Faye, Melissa, Donnie, Glenn, Dave, Jessica, Mason, Jax, Jeremy, Luke, Anna, Nova, and, and Father, we lift up to you uh, the lady that called today on the phone, and we lift up Mary to you. 
And you know the need there. And so we lift that to you, Father, today. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of reading these names. Thank you for the privilege of being able to pray for lost souls. Father, we are so unworthy of your mercy and your goodness and your grace. We're unworthy of salvation that you have given, but we're thankful, we're grateful. And tonight, Father, as we come into this study, I just pray that you'd open up our hearts and minds that we might be receptive to your word and to your will and to your way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this is where we left off, am I right? Yes. Hey, thank you. Okay, so that's what I was thinking anyhow. And so um, for sake of time, let's just back up one, one, one of these here. Let's see. Let's go ahead and start here in Romans 15, verse 11. And this is the, the kind of the, the close of the, the first point. We talked about believers rejoicing because of our relationship. And remember, we're talking about those who know. We're talking about uh, those who are knowing Jesus, getting to know Jesus closer and better, more intimately as a friend, right? And we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about knowing the Lord and the way the Lord works, knowing His, His, His heart. We want to be people like David was. David was a man after God's own heart. And even though David was a man after God's own heart, he messed up a lot, didn't he? He sure did. How many of y'all mess up a lot? How many mess up a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot? Yeah, yeah, all of us do. But thanks be unto God that God gives us the free gift of salvation. And when He saves you, He keeps you saved. Uh, so we talked about those who know we rejoice. Believers rejoice because of our relationship. And our relationship, as we talked about, is through the power of the Holy Ghost. That's how we get in the understanding, the knowledge, the concept of the hope that God gives us. And so tonight we want to start talking about and that is that rejoice in the midst of difficulties. Now, uh, I really wanted to bring up that prayer request before I, I came into this. Because to be honest with you, uh, we can see this from a biblical standpoint that we ought to be rejoicing because of our relationship with God. But if you're honest with me and I'm honest with you, there are many times in this walk with Christ, we're not rejoicing, are we? We go through low points, we go through sad times, we go through times of despair, times of misunderstanding. We go through great difficulties. And it's through those great difficulties that what to teach you tonight seems so very foreign. It seems like I have nothing to rejoice in. <clears throat> but the, the Bible says, in those things, those things in themselves, those things that we count as negative, those things that we count as detrimental, those things that we think are hardships, are the very things that you and I are to rejoice in. Not because of, but in. And we rejoice through them. Not because of them, but through them. Make sense? And so that's what this is about tonight. James said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. That word divers means various. And the word temptation there doesn't mean to be tempted to sin. It has the context of a trial, a tribulation, uh, some sort of a thing to try you. And so count it all joy when you fall into that. And notice that phrase, you fall into it. How many of you can understand exactly what James is talking about? You're going along, you're joy-filled, you're happy, everything's good, and then you fall into this terrible time. It comes out of the blue, doesn't it? I mean, if we could see the hard time at the end of the aisle, we'd go the other way. But it doesn't work that way. It would be like me falling off the platform right on my face. That's the way it is. We fall into these terrible trials. With that being said, I want you to grasp what he's about to teach us. Trials cause thanksgiving. You're not thanking God in them, although we're supposed to. In and give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You find that in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. 
It's one of my favorite verses, and it was one of the verses I had to learn after I had gone through some difficult times, some trials of my very own. I had to learn that verse, and no matter where I am, I try to quote that verse to myself every single day. Whether I'm on the mountaintop or I'm in the valley, I quote that verse to myself every day. Jill has it on a sign on the, on the wall at our house, so I remember it every day. I have to remind myself, because the devil tells me when hard times come, God don't love you, God's done with you, you're worthless, you're useless, you might as well just throw in the towel, you might as well quit, because you aren't doing anything anyway. And I'm sure the devil tells you the same thing. Am I right? Absolutely, because he lies to us all, doesn't he? So the trials are to cause thanksgiving. Acts chapter 5, <clears throat> and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, that doesn't sound like anything to be rejoicing in, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. We talked about this the other day, didn't we? And let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. I want you to understand, there is suffering and suffering for Jesus. There's a difference. If tomorrow you, instead of kicking your TV, went to your local politician and kicked them right in the shin, you're going to find a hardship coming your way, are you not? <laughs> so don't do that, Patsy, right? But if you are going to your local politician and trying to express to them that they need Jesus for salvation, and then they mistreat you and throw you into jail and falsely accuse you, you can rejoice because you've suffered. There's a whole different ball game right there. <coughs> and so, <coughs> so they were... <coughs> I have a cough drop. I don't know what's going on. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. And notice what happens. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when you are suffering for the cause of Christ, you will be emboldened, you will be stirred on the inside, you will be uh, solidified, you will realize that the battle is the Lord's, and you will have a great boldness about you because of the Holy Spirit of God that's in you. And you will rejoice. I know I've told you all this a million times, but the first time I ever went out soul winning, I was scared to death. I had just gotten saved. We just started going to a Baptist church in Harrisonburg. I had never shared my faith with anybody. And my pastor decided it would be a great idea to take me out and hand out tracts. So here we are at Kroger parking lot. And I didn't know who to talk to first. There was this mean looking guy over there and this ugly looking dude over here. There's this sweet little old lady sitting in a car. Window was down. It was, and I thought, well, perfect. This sweet little old lady will be nice to me. So I gave her a, I gave her a track and invited her to church. She used words I had never heard before and told me things about my mom I did not know. <laughs> and I was absolutely dumbfounded. And so then I, I thought, is this the way it's going to go all the time? And then I saw these, these two or three, I forget what, I think it was three Mennonite ladies come walking. I'm like, oh, praise God, Mennonite ladies. So I walked up to these midnight ladies and she took it and threw it on the ground and said, I don't want this trash. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I was so discouraged. I didn't want to go back soul winning anymore. Right? You ever been there? If not, y'all should give it a whirl. <laughs> but I also, at the same time, I was so excited because I had actually tried to do something for Jesus, I got cussed out. I got fussed at by sin sifter wearing ladies. I mean, how much better could it get? And I soon learned from that first day of soul winning, you know who wants to hear the gospel? The people who have nothing. The people who are downcast. The people who are dirty. The people that work hard the people that don't have a whole lot, they want to hear the gospel. 
Religious people could care less about the gospel. And so apparently sweet little old ladies don't want to hear the gospel. <laughs> but I learned a valuable lesson that, that very first day, and I didn't really understand it until my pastor explained it to me. Hey, praise God. You know, wait till you get spit on, pushed, shoved, cussed out. I'm like, well, one out of three. She didn't spit on me, and she was too old to get out of the car and push me, so I'm all good. But I have been pushed. I have been shoved. I have been spit on. I have been cussed. I have been threatened. I mean, all those things have happened when you're out soul winning. But it doesn't discourage you. It actually makes you want to keep going more. Because you realize that all these people desperately need Jesus. And if these people are so vocal about how they desperately need Jesus and don't even know it, imagine all the masses of people that need Jesus that don't even know they need Jesus that are ready to hear about Jesus. And folks, they're out there. We had a soul winning training here, which I'm going to do again soon. We had soul winning training. And uh, the Timothy Club, the first night we went, it was when uh, Zeke and Cindy were still here, and it was me and somebody, I forget, and Zeke and Cindy, and we went soul winning, and I was knocking on doors. We were down at the quadrangle, and I was knocking on doors, and uh, this older black lady answered the door, and, and I gave a track, and, and she said, I'm not interested. And I'm like, okay, so we went on down to the next door, and about that time, her door flew up and said, I don't care about it, but my granddaughter wants to hear about it. And so we went in. This happened. I, I, I mean, this, this was amazing. So we went in. Here's this girl, teenage girl. And we go in, and I share the gospel with her. And she's weeping and crying, going, I need Jesus. I, I need Jesus. I want to be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. She prayed and she, she gave her heart to the Lord and she was rejoicing and hugging. Grandma was getting in on this. She didn't get saved, but she was getting in on it. About that time, the back door opened. This humongous black dude. He's bigger than me and AJ and Wes put together. In my mind at that time. He come in the back door and saw a bunch of white people in there and his daughter crying. He wasn't happy. He said, what's going on in here? And his daughter said, Daddy, I got saved. He fell on his knees right there in the door and started weeping. He said, I've been praying all day that somebody would come and tell my daughter about Jesus. Come on, that's the way God works, y'all. And I want you to know that. You're going to get rejected and you're going to get rejected and you're going to get rejected. But every once in a while, if you allow those rejections, if you rejoice in and through those rejections, God's going to use you. He's going to use you. The field is white unto harvest. The laborers are few. Everybody still with me? <clears throat> so trials cause thanksgiving. And when you're thankful to God, you just want to do more for God, don't you? Makes sense, doesn't it? If I'm thankful for, for you, I want to do more for you. If you're thankful for me, you want to do more for me, right? That's the way it works in the human world. Trials cause happiness when viewed properly. Not, not just joy, but happiness. Happiness is not joy. Happiness is an elated feeling because of something that's happening. And so this elated feeling because something is happening when properly, when you're going through a trial and you view it pr uh, properly, you will have an elated feeling. It's not joy, but it's happiness. And it makes no sense to a lost world. Look at 1 Peter 4. Beloved, he's talking about those of us who are saved. Think it not strange concerning, what's that phrase? The fiery trial. <clears throat> Think about that. Not only do we fall in them, through those trials, it's like falling into the pits of hell sometimes, is it not? They're fiery trials. The only time you have fiery is when the devil's involved. And folks, the devil gets involved in your life whether you know it or not. God saved you. The Holy Spirit of God has indwelled you. And the devil 
and the demons are your enemy. And they are always working to try to burn you up, to destroy you. And so think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. You are not going through anything that somebody else has not or is not going through. You may have some unique circumstances. The, the names are changed, right? But it's the same. It's the same. We all go through the same stuff. The devil isn't as smart as we think he is. He has a pattern. Let me tell you this. The devil is smarter than we are. Would you agree? And the devil knows more of the Bible. The devil knows human behavior. He's had thousands of years to study it. But the devil does the same thing over and over and over. He does the same pattern over and over and over. And he will always use the same pattern. He will always use the same thing. And you and I need to understand that. He's limited in his smartness, in his in his understanding. He's limited by what God allows him to know. And we must understand that. Now with that being said, look at this. But rejoice in as much as you're partaking of Christ's suffering. He thought he, had the de he thought he had Christ defeated, did he not? But Jesus got up the third day. Guess what? The think he's got us defeated, but we're going to get up one day too. And have you ever read in the Bible where we judge angels? We're not going to judge the good ones. There's no need to judge them. They never fail. We only judge that which is against the law and which is against God. We're going to judge them, dirty rascals. What all that entails, I don't know and neither do you. But the Bible says that. And so we need to understand the devil's going to do everything he can to defeat you now because one day you're going to judge those angels. All of us together are going to judge them and we're going to see them cast into a lake of fire forever and forever and forever. Is that not awesome? So notice this. You may be glad also with the joy if you be reproached for the name of Christ. What's that next word? Happy. You're happy because... Aided feeling by the happenings. What's the happening? The happening is that His glory shall be revealed. When God's glory is revealed in you and through you, you're going to be happy. When God's work is through you here, you're going to be happy. When God's work is through in you, you're going to be happy. It's a win-win for you and I. Everybody with me? For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. You ought to rejoice in that. You ought to underline that. You don't have to go looking for the Holy Spirit of God. He's already there. On their part, He is evil spoken of, but on your part, He is glorified. So those who know, we rejoice. Believers rejoice in the midst of difficulties. Trials cause thanksgiving. Trials cause happiness when viewed properly. Just this one, trials cause growth and healing. I want you to know you've got a lot of growing to do. You've got a lot of growing to do. I may not be what I once was, but I'm not what I need to be. Matter of fact, the, more I, the older I get in Christ, the more I realize I'm not what I ought to be. Isn't that amazing? When you were a young one, when you first started out, when you first got saved, you didn't realize how horrible you really were. You had to wait till you come to church and let Pastor Paul tell you. <laughs> but you didn't realize how horrible you were. But as you grow in grace and knowledge, you realize just how good the grace of God is. Because you know what? Maybe I sin different. Maybe I don't say the same words that I did when I first got saved and messed up. Maybe I, I don't go to the same places I did when I first got saved and messed up. I've, I matured a little bit. But in my maturity, I am more rebellious on purpose. How about you? And when I get rebellious on purpose, sometimes God has to bring me some trials. And sometimes God has to allow me to fall into that fiery trial so to show me that I have not arrived yet. 
And every time I go through it, I hate it going into it. I hate it while I'm in it. I'm thankful when I get out of it. But I have learned a lesson every single time. How about you? If you, <coughs> if you haven't learned your lesson, you're going to go through the same trial again. I've learned that. Are y'all with me? Look at Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 12. Now no chastening for the present seemeth Who wants to be corrected and chastened and rebuked? Who wants to get a spanking up here in front of the church? Nobody, right? No. And so none of us want to be publicly whipped. By the way, when you're chastened by the Lord, it's visible. Y'all are looking at me weird like I'm from outer space. Anytime you get chastened and corrected and rebuked by God, it's all over your face. I mean, people are like, what's wrong with you? No, ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. I'm fine. Are you sure you are? Yeah, I'm fine, man. I'm fine. Anything I can help you with? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Just quit digging. You understand? And so it's on your face. It's in your, it's, it's in your countenance. And the Lord allows that to bring us to this place. And it is, according to the Bible, it's, it's not joyous when you're going through it. It's grievous. It's a hard thing to go through. I would love to say, boy, I got saved and I've never been to God's woodshed. But I've been to God's woodshed. There'll come a time if you haven't come to it yet in your life, God don't take you to the woodshed anymore. God does not chasten you like you're a baby or a small child or a toddler anymore. All of a sudden... It's worse. You know you have disappointed your heavenly father. You know you have let him down. You know you have brought reproach upon his name. And that's worse than going to the woodshed when you're a young Christian. But when you're a young Christian, you don't want to deal with it. As you get older, you don't want to deal with it. And I don't know what it's like after that because I ain't there. But I am sure that as I mature, I'll find out what it is next. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. (laughs) I'll figure it out. Maybe the Lord will come and I don't have to figure it out. But I can tell you this. It's grievous. But it grows us. It grows us. Did your mom and dad whoop your butt? Not a spanking. I never got a spanking. I got my butt whooped. My mom would grab whatever's close. She like turns into ninja. Pot, pan, yard stick, spoon, shoe, whatever's close. My dad, on the other hand, when he corrected me, he was going to talk to me until I was ready to be beat so I wouldn't have to hear how bad I have disappointed him. And sometimes I'd hear that, whoosh, do, 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 do. it was about to be on. And my dad would always tell me, this is going to hurt you a whole lot worse than it hurts me. <laughs> Matter of fact, a few times he said, I've been waiting on this a long time. I don't know what he meant by that. <laughs> <laughs> but every time I learned my lesson, I learned. I learned my lesson. Don't do that. If you don't want that consequence, don't do that. You see, that's what the chasing is for. That's what the rebuke is for. That's what it's for. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's not right. But you know what? I would rather my dad, I'd rather hear the and get a spanking than have to sit there in his room while he sat in the chair and was doing whatever he was working on on his desk, not even look me in the eye and talk to me, and then turn around and look at me eyeball to eyeball and go, I'm so disappointed in you. I really thought you could do better. I thought you'd be better than this by now. That hurt. Do you realize we want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? 
But if we don't learn our lessons, do you think we'll hear that? Or do you think we'll hear, you made it because of my grace, but I really thought you'd have been better. I really thought you could have done better. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to think that or know that. I want to give my all. How about you? Yeah. So no, oh, whoops. Let me go back. So look at this, and we're going we're gonna to camp here, and I'll finish this next week. Now, no chasing for the present seemeth to be what? See, gee, we were talking about chasing. Look how you, you just said the word joyous. It's just not joyous. We were talking about ice cream. You'd be like, joyous. Rocky Road, joyous, right? No, but notice it's grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of what? Righteousness. Folks, sometimes the suffering we go, we go through makes us more righteous. We're not more righteous to other people. I'm not more righteous now than I was when I got saved. It makes us peaceable. We yield in the peaceable fruit of righteousness. What that means is we learn our lesson and we yield to the righteousness of Christ that's in us. When we yield to the righteousness of Christ in us, we are becoming more like Jesus and less like us. I don't want to get to the end of my life, whether the end of my life is tonight or the end of my life is in another 20 years or so, I don't want to get to the end of my life and be more like me and less like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And I realize when I first got saved, there were leaps and bounds that I went through. When I got saved, every other word was a filth, florin, and filth. Then God didn't take that from me. I had to surrender that. The Lord had to chasten me. I say it in the wrong time. I say it at the wrong place. And the Lord would chasten me. And I had to yield and yield it to Him. And determine, I'm not going to say them things anymore. I wish I could tell you I have not said them things anymore. But I, make me mad, you'll find out. Preacher, no preacher. I'll drop it on you. Because when I get mad, I get mad. How about you? Yeah, I haven't arrived yet. I'm glad for those who don't do that. I'm really, to me, that's just amazing. I ain't there. Don't try. I know it's tempting. Right, But I, I mean, I used, I used to cuss. I had a lot of bad habits, a lot of bad traits, a lot of bad characteristics. And I didn't get rid of them overnight. It took years of making a fool out of myself, saying things, acting ways, doing things that were, were not right, dishonest, ungodly. And as I saw the repercussions and the Lord would convict me and chasten me, and I saw how that action hurt other people, then I had to yield to this. I'm not more righteous in the sight of God today than I was the day I got saved because I have the righteousness of Jesus accounted to me, and so do you. I am just a work in progress, but I am to be more like Jesus now and less like the old me. And the more I grow and the closer I get to the day of my graduation to heaven, I ought to be more like Jesus. We ought to strive to be like Enoch. He was not, for God took him. He was just walking, talking with the Lord. And bam, the Lord just said, come on home. That's what we ought to strive for. Am I right? And the Bible tells us if we're looking for the blessed hope, which is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, we'll live in such a fashion, we'll talk in such a way, we'll walk in such a way that we will not be ashamed at His coming. <coughs> now, let's put this where the rubber meets the road. 
if the Lord convicts me and chastens me, let's say I act a way that's just totally foolish. It's not beyond the scope of my abilities. And the Holy Spirit of God corrects me, is chastening me, and I go, no, God, I've had about enough. Had about enough. Do you realize that God will allow you to stay right there? He'll allow it. You want to be a baby Christian? You can stay a baby Christian. There are a lot of people in this world that are baby Christians. I'm glad they're saved. But they have been chastened and corrected and rebuked over and over and over for the same thing over and over and over. And they tell God, no, I'm going to do what I want to do until God says, fine, you do what you want to do. Let's see how that works out for you. Are you all understanding this? So let's just take our own, our own experiences, our own life. We're almost done. Our own life, our own experiences. Do you remember where you were the first time the Lord severely chastened you and you felt like a dirt bag? You felt like scum? Any of y'all remember that? I can tell you where I was. I got saved on a Thursday night. Friday morning, I told everybody I got saved. Told my boss, went in and told him I got saved. He was a Catholic. He didn't understand what I was talking about. And I was working on a door, putting spring hinges on. I'm running the drill. Them hinges slung through right on my fingers. I said a lot of bad words. And I looked up and there's my boss. And he said, I thought you got saved. I looked at the floor. I wanted to crawl in a hole. I wanted to die because I knew I had messed up. You know, sadly, right now, I could probably do the same thing and I could justify myself. I could even find Bible verses to justify myself. How about you? Isn't it sad? That as we are to grow closer to God, what we're actually doing is we grow closer to self-justification instead of growing closer to this righteousness. We all do it. We all do it. Let me try it again for those of you that are quiet. We all do it. But when we realize we do it, then and only then can we repent of it and go, dear God, boy, I'm a mess. Never. Never stop. Notice this, and we're, we're done. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down. So you done something stupid. You said something stupid. You behaved in a way you ought not. And the Holy Spirit of God has corrected you. Well, look up. You're still saved. And your redemption is still drawing nigh. Lift up them feeble hands, which hang down, and the feeble knees. Feeble knees means you're shaking and quaking. Stop. Stand firm. Stand firm upon the rock of Christ. Yeah, you messed up. Own it. Own it. I did it. I'm sorry. God, I'm not going to promise you I'll never do it again. Because you know I probably will. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid for this on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. Do you get it? And when you start thanking God, I want you to know what's going to happen. Look at this. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out, but let it rather be healed. When you start thanking God, God, acknowledging God, rejoicing in God, understanding that all these things you're going through, even if you brought them upon yourself, they are to make you grow. And we grow in grace and knowledge. And you are growing when you go through this in grace. Because folks, I can tell you this, I was a jerk for Jesus when I first got saved. Anybody else a jerk for Jesus when you first got saved? I was a jerk for Jesus. I had to make sure I was right. Being right was the only thing that was important to me. 
now that I have failed my God so many times. I want to be loving, compassionate, tender-hearted, merciful, forgiving. I want to have that grace. And I'm still a work in progress. How about you? Yeah. But that's what I want. I want to grow old and sweet, not old and bitter. That's the only two choices you got, people. Old and bitter or old and better. I want to grow old and better. Sweet, loving. I want to be the little old fuzzy grandpa that just loves Jesus. That's what I want to be. Because I have been forgiven. I have been loved. I have been cared for when I deserved much worse. How about you? Amen. So there you go. Those who know, rejoice. You're growing closer to the Lord. In all that you go through, you're going to learn to rejoice. I hope it was a blessing to somebody tonight. We're going to pray and go home. I hope I see you Sunday. Uh, but if I don't, I'll see you next Wednesday. How about that? We'll pick up right here. Yeah, men's prayer breakfast at 8 o'clock Saturday morning. It ain't going to snow. Lord. <laughs> Please, Lord. We need to eat food at Golden Corral. <laughs>